It is a story that has become very familiar across our area and even across the nation. On June 27, 1995, a blanket of fear lay over this small town. I would like to confirm that we are officially uh, classifying this as an abduction today. A morning show anchor abducted on her way to work. Oh yeah, first I do the news, you're right. Then I do the okay. news. Okay, good thinking, way to go. 20 years later, the case remains unsolved. What really happened in the parking lot of this Iowa apartment complex? Did she know her abductor? It was somebody she knew, and I think the person thought, if I can't have her, nobody will. After all these years, many theories have floated around as well as many potential suspects. But to the frustration of many, no one called 911 after hearing the scream in the early hours of June 27th. Maybe someday we'll get justice. It's just really not fair. Today I want to talk about what happened to Jody Husentrude. This case has so many twists and turns and it's like every so often it's like boom, twist, bam, turn. When I was doing research for the case, I kept thinking that I knew what happened or like, okay, this is it. And then, nope, not even close. I'm definitely going to be wearing my tinfoil hat for the theories because some of these are scandalous, crazy. They, you think they would be far-fetched, but then when you look at like what happened, they're not that far-fetched, but they're still crazy. Do you get what I'm saying? Anyway, so I'm going to give you guys the facts, okay? And then we'll discuss the theories and then you can decide for yourself. So the whole thing started on June 27th, 1995 in Mason City, Iowa. Jody, who was a local TV news anchor, didn't show up to work. See, she usually gets to the TV station between like 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. So when 4 a.m. came and went and Jody wasn't there, her coworker Amy, called her apartment. I said, Jody, are you awake? Are you coming into work? She goes, what time is it? You know, the typical questions. According to Amy, Jody seemed fine. It seemed like that phone call woke her up and she was sort of scrambling to get ready and come to work, but she didn't seem like she was distressed or anything like was wrong. That was the last time that anyone heard from Jody. When it was like hours later and she still didn't show up and they were calling her and she wasn't picking up, they're like, we need to go to her apartment. They go there and they see that her car is in a really messed up situation. They end up calling the cops. When the cops show up, they immediately determine that Jody must have been kidnapped because they see her vehicle, the doors open, there's her car keys like bent and it's on the ground. And then her items are everywhere like her hairspray, her hair dryer, her red high heels. They're all there. And she used to keep these items in this tote bag that she would take to work, but the tote bag was missing. Jody obviously wasn't there. And then it had rained. And so according to one of the officers, he saw these like drag marks from her shoes in the asphalt and there was also a palm print on the hood of Jody's car. So based on all of that information, they were like someone came up behind her when she was trying to get into her car in like the wee hours of the morning, like probably between four and 5 a.m. So it was pitch black or, or dark and they kidnapped her. The sad thing here is that neighbors said they heard screaming at around the time that police think Jody was kidnapped. The, the thing is they did not call the cops because this video is sponsored by Lumi, a new different kind of deodorant, kind of like actually a pre-odorant where it prevents you from having odor and it's aluminum free, baking soda free, and super effective. After my workout, I'm not able to take a shower and then I need to run errands and go and do things afterwards. Usually, and I've told this story before, I have odor. And with Lumi, I don't. Another thing about Lumi, it's a whole body deodorant. They have like eight cents, cool cucumber, peony rose, but my personal favorite is clean tangerine. It's very like citrusy, fresh, but also like sweet. Right now, Lumi, they're having this promotion where you can get their starter pack, which includes the deodorant, stick full size, as well as the whole body cream, which I'm gonna show you these two uh, applied. It goes on clear, you see? And this also, when you rub it in, it goes on clear. 
And then they also have a mini body wash and uh, wipes. These are two free things you can get. They're having a promotion where the starter pack is 30% off, but if you use my code, you get an additional promotion on top of that. So my code, which is Noor, N-O-O-R, click the link in the description, use that code, you'll get an additional $5 off, which brings it to a total of 40% off the starter pack. Thank you so much for watching and thank you to Lumi for sponsoring this video. This apartment building was near a campground and this campground, the campers that would visit there would be noisy, especially at night and stuff like that. So when they heard screaming early in the morning, they just assumed it was one of the campers at the campground and they did not call police. Then there was another neighbor who said that he saw a white van that had the lights on and the engine running in the parking lot at around the time that Jody was kidnapped. It's a mid-1980s white Ford Econo line. We were unable to account who that belonged to. Then there's another neighbor. This neighbor is John Van Sice. Now John was Jody's friend and he went up to police that morning when she had gone missing and he told them, I was the last person to see her. Essentially last night she was at my place, my apartment, which is in the complex. And the reason why she was there was because he was showing her a video of her birthday party that he organized for her and filmed. And he said she was there for about 20 minutes and then she went back to her apartment and that's it, nobody saw her. The thing about John Van Sice is that a lot of people say that he was uh, infatuated with Jody. He was much older than Jody, like over 20 years older than her. And he seemed to have a romantic interest in Jody, but Jody did not feel the same way. The night before Jody went missing, she called her friend but her friend didn't pick up, her friend's husband answered and was like, oh, she's not available. And they spoke for a little bit and then she hung up the phone. And according to her friend's husband, at that time, the night before she went missing, he said she sounded fine, normal. She didn't seem like she was in distress or, or anything. She sounded fine. When police searched Jody's apartment, they found her diary and they also found her answering machine and there were some messages on the answering machine. Remember that for later. She's clearly a very active young woman, as everyone has told us. I mean, clearly this is a woman that's just headed out to work. has. And they found out that the weekend before she disappeared, so just a few days before she went missing, she was hanging out with her friends. Okay, so remember the neighbor, John Van Sice, she was hanging out with him, as well as her friend, Tammy Baker. So they went like water skiing. They were playing some water sports because John Van Sice, he had a boat and he named the boat Jody. Okay, this is another thing people bring up is that like he was really into Jody. I even named my boat after her because just, just because she's Jody and she's she's been such a big part of my life here lately and, and she just makes me feel so good. She was spending more time with with John than she was with really anyone. I did ask her at one point if they were, if they were involved and she, said absolutely not. Jody's sister told us she was uncomfortable while eating breakfast with Van Sice the day after Jody disappeared. All of a sudden, and I said, didn't Jody ever mention her dad? No, she never mentioned her dad to me at all. And he just kind of pushed his chair back and he was real cold, very unfriendly at that point. Remember how I told you police found her diary and there were messages on her answering machine? Well, one of the messages on her answering machine was from a quote, mystery man. Okay, we don't know who this guy is. We found out from a private investigator way later, like police never released this person, but we found out that this is someone that she had this like really hot and heavy relationship with, that she met him only 10 days before she went missing, that they got really close really fast to where they were talking on the phone every day. And he had left her a message on this machine that police 
saw, I mean, heard when they went to search her apartment and they contacted him. He claims that they interrogated him and questioned him like pretty aggressively. And, but nothing came of that. He's not been named as a suspect or anything, but there was this man that she was having some sort of relationship with. So people wonder, hmm, did she see him or talk to him or meet up with him or something to where she slept later than usual? And is that why she overslept? We don't know, but we do know that this person had a message on her machine and that she'd been talking to him every day for 10 days leading up to her disappearance. According to this person, they went for dinner, they had drinks, they played golf. It was a quote whirlwind relationship and hot and heavy, if you will. So at this point, it seems like police are suspecting either John Van Sice, the last person who saw her, has these sort of maybe feelings for her. And then there's also this mystery man and there's also this third option of what if she just like had a stalker because remember she's a local tv news anchor she's young she's attractive could there have been someone watching her whether from tv or just in general at her apartment and was like lying in wait and kidnapped her and it's someone she doesn't even know and the thing that led people to believe this is that Jody said that she was getting these weird calls uh, from a creep and that there was this one incident where she was walking down the street and she says this pickup truck was following her. Jody's concern for her own safety brought her to police asking for information on how she could protect herself. She also wanted to enroll in a self-defense class prior to her disappearance. She alluded to the fact that she just wasn't feeling comfortable her situation, getting up early in the morning and going to work by herself. So she was kind of worried about something like this happening and then what something like that happened. So the weird thing here is that there are sort of like conflicting reports about whether this was a stalker or someone she knew and whether it was one person or more than one person because Jody's sister, Joanne, she says that the landlord told her that there were two different male voices at around the time that Jody screamed and was taken and that they heard the sound of a loud muffler. But there's an officer who's investigating this case. His name is Frank Stearns and he said that there's no evidence of a stalker and that he believes it's, it's just one person who was responsible for this. So I don't know what to make of that but that's the, a thing. The reason why this is kind of weird and I brought it up is because Frank Stearns, the officer that was one of the officers investigating this case, there's going to be a huge scandal and accusation against him with regards to this case. So this is the first crazy twist that happens in this case. Jody, she went missing in 1995. In 2010, she was officially declared dead. And then in 2007, something happened. There is a Mason City police officer, and this is the town where Jody went missing in the police department that's handling her case. This officer, Maria Ohl, okay, she claims that in 2007, she got a tip that officers from her police department, the one covering this case, Mason City, were involved in Jody's disappearance. She says that in 2007, she did not have any names from this person who gave her this tip. Keep that in the back of your mind because in 2009, two years later, she is going to get another tip from another person saying the same thing, but this time giving her specific names. But something happened in between this tip with no names in 2007 and the tip with names in 2009. In 2008, something else weird happens, okay? Remember how I told you that when officers searched Jody's apartment, they found her diary? Well, in 2008, photocopies of Jody's diary were mailed to the local newspaper anonymously. Soon after, the newspaper was able to determine with confirmation from the police that it was the wife of a former police officer of Mason City who mailed these photocopies. The original diary was in possession of the police and is supposed to be, you know, in a safe place in the police department. But for whatever reason, this officer had photocopies made, took it home, 
and had them there. And then the wife found it. Apparently they were moving and she was going through stuff and she found Jody's diary photocopies in her home, knowing that her husband had access to that and was working the case. And she decides to send it to the news. Why? I don't know, but that's what happened. So that was like a little bit weird. And people were like, what, why? Well, we don't know why that happened and who exactly she is, but I do want to read you a few things from the diary. The diary had entries from 1994 all the way up to just like two days before Jody went missing in June 27th, 1995. And she talked about different things like her career, her goals, whatever. But then there were a few entries where she talks about relationships with men. And then also the last three entries in her diary before she went missing all mention John Van Sys. So I want to read some of those to you. So she apparently met this guy on a cruise a few months before she went missing and she wrote, why do I get hooked so fast? I'm lonely here at times and would like to have someone to share my life with. Sure, I meet men, but none that really strikes me or who follows through. So then the last three entries in Jody's diary that mentioned John Van Sice. Sunday, June 11th, 1995. She says, what a weekend, surprise. My Mason City Clear Lake friends threw a big party for me at a lounge, wild. It was in Clear Lake, they had a 16 gallon keg, huge cake with a skier, so much left. John Van Sice grilled 150 pork burgers. We were dancing on tables, dancing everywhere. Everyone had a ball. Video camera was rolling, cameras were clicking. Oh, what fun. Life is so good. The party made me feel so good. Then on Tuesday, June 13th, 1995, she says, last night, John and I went to the Glenn Miller Orchestra in Belmont. I have so many great viewers. People are so kind. This nice, we this nice weather has me wild. I bought a new Mazda Miata. Simply love it. She mentions John. She also mentions, I have so many great viewers. So maybe she was recognized when she went out by people who watch her on the news. So it could be a stalker among those. And then the Mazda Miata, she had just purchased it according to her diary, that's the vehicle that was found with all her stuff strewn about. So this is the last entry in her diary two days before she went missing. Sunday, June 27th. She says, got home from a weekend road trip to Iowa City. Oh, we had fun. It was wild partying and water skiing. We skied at the Coralville Riz, maybe resort something. I'm improving on the skis, hips up, lean, etc. John's son, Trent, this is John Van Sice, gave me some great ski tip advice. Today, Sunday, it was raining in Mason City, so didn't get any skiing in. I love it, it's addicting. Great friends, but professionally, I'm fed up. It's difficult finding a new job, and I'm confused about agent and what to do. And then two days later is when she went missing in the wee hours of the morning. Over 10 years after Jody went missing, these diaries were sent to the newspaper. A year later, in 2009, Remember the officer I told you, Maria, who had gotten a tip in 2007 that officers were involved in Jody's disappearance? Well, she says another person gives her the same tip, but this time they have names. And who are these officers' names? Okay, well, remember Officer Frank Stearns, the one I told you about? He was named Lieutenant Frank Stearns, also Lieutenant Ron Vandeweerd, and these are two Mason City cops. And then also a third person was named, and this is someone on the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation, and it is Bill Bassler. At this time, Maria, she reports this internally, but it's not public knowledge yet in 2009 that like officers are involved. But what ends up happening from this internal thing is she says she gets retaliation, and there's all this drama and history. She gets fired. She ends up suing them. And it becomes this whole public thing. It was terminated just on August 4th. And it's actually in relation to the Jody who's in her case. I received information from multiple sources that a couple of our lieutenants were potentially involved in the murder and abduction of Jody. They are current. They have not been suspended. I received information from, like I said, multiple sources and tried to refer the information 
uh, my superiors said that I did not handle it properly. All I want is the truth to come out. If this is potentially true, it needs to be taken seriously, which I believe has not happened, at least on the part of Mason City Police Department. I had a rifle pointed at me. Obviously, it was empty. I heard the click of the trigger being pulled. I turned around, he had it pointed at my head. In 1995, when the Jody Houston Trail incident occurred, they were not tied up in the police department. Members of the North Central Iowa Narcotics Task Force were involved in the murder, in the abduction, in the abduction and alleged murder of Jody Houston Trail. September 29th, 2010, they put me on. All I want is for the truth to come out. The situation is a bit complicated and I want to explain it to you. So this officer, Maria, she is part of this church. It's called the uh, Christian Fellowship Church. Now her brother-in-law is the pastor of this church and he has a beef with the Mason City Police where she works. The beef is that Apparently the police chief and another officer, they made some comments about his church and his finances, which led to the IRS investigating Maria's brother-in-law, the pastor. He ends up getting cleared by the IRS, but as a result of this, he sues the police chief and the officer, and he wins, he gets a settlement, and now there's like this beef between this church and this pastor and the police the Mason City Police. Who's in the middle of this? Maria, who's an officer and also this pastor is her brother-in-law. And she claims that ever since this incident happened, she's been getting harassed and discriminated against by the officers that she works with. She says that already there were issues between them. And then now she brings this information that she's heard that some of these officers are involved in what happened to Jody, and she says that's when essentially she got fired. They said she mishandled this information and they fired her. And so she felt like this was retaliation for being a quote whistleblower, and that the people who have been accused, who are handling the very case they're being accused of being involved in, have not been put on administrative leave, even if it was paid or something, that they're still there, they're still working the case, and she thinks this is crazy. So she ends up appealing her firing and going public, and it becomes this like huge story. And the officers that have been named, they don't talk about it, they don't respond. There's this hearing that happens, and what ends up happening is they settle. They settle for, she gets a settlement for like $95,000, and we kind of don't hear anything about it after that. These accused officers are still working the case, and it seems like nobody's talking about this until 2016. Another twist in the case. This time, a politician, he makes some shocking claims. Okay, his name is John Kuiker, okay, and he wrote an article when he was retiring, which said some crazy things, such as that he believes that the Mason City Police were covering up what happened to Jody. I'm gonna read you a few things from the letter and I'll show, show you the full letter if you wanna read it, but these are the parts I wanna to read to you. So he says, with the assistance of other legislators, I circulated a letter addressed to the city of Mason City, asking them to recognize the 20th anniversary of Jody's disappearance and soliciting help in solving the case. All 100 state representatives signed the letter. I talked to one of Jody's sisters and she had no objections. Mason City area legislators offered to notify Mason city officials of the pending letter. That news elicited some rather strange reactions. So the police chief, Mike Lashbrook, insisted that he did not want the letter to be sent to him or anybody else in Mason City. Mayor Eric Bookmeyer complied and vouched for what was a wonderful job the chief had been doing and that he was close to retirement so he did not need this issue to come before the public and sully his record. The mayor begged me to withdraw the letter and was worried about putting too much pressure on the chief. I was even accused of meddling and not respecting local control. 
The chief's mysterious reaction manifested through the mayor makes sense if the Mason City Police Department is mishandling the case. Indeed, I soon realized certain leads first filed in 2008 had been ignored for at least seven years. I spoke with DCI Director Jim Saunders. He explained that due to the complexity of this case, the Mason City Police Department was supposedly notifying Iowa DCI of all leads since 1995. But for reasons unknown, the Mason City Police Department concealed the 2008 leads from Iowa DCI until 2015. Director Saunders assured me all leads would be investigated. However, I was also informed that under Iowa law, the local police department owns the case. DCI is only available to assist and does not have enough resources to do so. Without jeopardizing the leads in question, I will simply say the Mason City Police Department seems to have a dubious lack of interest in following up on leads that could shed the light of day on Jody Husentruth's disappearance. Generally, I would not describe myself as a person who is untrusting, but I have this gut feeling that something is being covered up in Mason City. Oh my gosh. So now you've got an officer, Maria, coming out and saying, you know, I've got two separate people telling me that these officers are involved and I got retaliation when I reported it. Nothing was followed up on. And now you have this politician who's like, I tried to figure out what was going on with this case and I got so much pushback and I feel like they're covering something up. So now everyone is speculating that, oh my God, could cops have been responsible for this? And are they covering up for each other? Like what is going on? A few months after this article was written by this politician, the police execute a search warrant on the GPS of John Van Sice's vehicles. But the weird thing about this is that John Van Sice, the vehicles that they had a warrant for were manufactured after Jody disappeared. So it doesn't seem like they think these vehicles were necessarily involved in maybe her kidnapping, but maybe there were some GPS data of things he did after the fact that they thought were worth um, investigating. The thing is that this search warrant has been sealed. It, it leaked on the findjody.com website, which is a website made by her colleagues who are also reporters and journalists um, trying to find out what happened to her. They found out that this warrant existed, but then it got sealed and it keeps getting sealed. And so they don't have the exact details of why they want this vehicle. Although people suspect Joe Van Sice, he's never been named a suspect. Nothing ever came from it. Same thing with the police. People suspect all these things with these officers. Nothing came from it. And then in 2020, there was a billboard that was put up for Jody, like bringing awareness, reminding people about it, trying to get information. Well, this billboard was vandalized. Well, Vandal spray painted the name Frank Stearns onto that sign. He's the longtime Mason City investigator who worked on the case. They spray painted Frank Stearns name on there, which is the officer that M Maria accused, Officer Maria, former officer, sorry, she accused him of being involved, right? Or she said that she got a tip that he was involved. And then also they spray painted machine shed on there as well. Months after this billboard was vandalized, there was a private investigator, Steve Ridge, who has been looking into this case. And he's been coming out over the years as of late and he's been talking about new information that he has, as well as new subjects, uh, not subjects, sorry, suspects. So I want to mention some of these other suspects as well. So the first one, there was this inmate who was on death row. And he was involved in like drugs and like tr drug trafficking and whatnot. His name is Dustin Honkin. And he was on death row for murdering five people in the 90s. It was being said that he claimed to know what happened to Jody. And then sort of these rumors of a potential connection with drugs in the area, because apparently at that time in the 90s, in that area in Mason City, there was a big issue with drugs and Jody being a reporter, people speculated, could she have, you know, uncovered something or was going to report about something and the people who she was maybe going to expose were trying to stop her and that's why she got hurt or kidnapped. But according to... The people who knew her, they said that she didn't cover stories like that and they don't really think that that was 
a factor in what happened to her. Uh, but this person, Dustin, he claimed, but he ends up getting executed. And again, nothing comes from that. Um, but then there was another suspect who was also an inmate. His name is Tony Dewan Jackson. Jackson worked in Mason City and lived near the station where Jody worked. Now, he was a convicted serial R-worder, and he had R-worded many women in the same area and around the same time that Jody was kidnapped. Nothing that would link the crime to Jackson. Again, we investigated him went back and uh, went over what he was doing the day before and day of and that sort of thing. And it's highly, un to me, it's very unlikely that he was he's involved. Then there was another suspect. Now this is also another inmate and this person is called Thomas Korskaden. And he's currently incarcerated as well in prison. Now his ex-wife said that he was actually obsessed with Jody and he drove a white van at the time that Jody was kidnapped that he called his, quote, porn palace. And remember, neighbors reported seeing a white van that was parked in the parking lot where Jody was kidnapped with the lights on and the car running at that time. Remember how there was also this palm print on the hood of Jody's car. So apparently, uh, the police got a warrant to get Thomas's palm print to compare it to the one on the hood of Jody's car. And according to this article that I read, he was meeting with officers and then he like freaked out and got quote unquote belligerent and would not let them take his palm print. And the weird thing is, it's like, I feel like if they have a warrant, does he even have a say in that? According to this article, they said that, um, they don't know if they actually got his palm print. And if they, if they did, they don't know if it's a match. And then when I went online, um, on the findjody.com forum, there was all this talk that like maybe officers don't have the palm print anymore to reference and that the evidence, something happened to the evidence. So I don't know, but again, nothing came of that either. So there's like all these potential leads and they seem very, very close, but then nothing. That is the latest information on this case. Now what I want to do is I want to talk about the theories and I do need to uh, protect myself from lawsuits because some of these with the names that are being named and the speculation, like I want to make sure that nobody um, sues me because this is conspiracy theory, speculation, uh, please don't sue me. First thing I want to start with allegedly, uh, allegedly, allegedly is the officer theory because that is the most scandalous, crazy one that like, threw me for a loop because, okay, there are two people that are saying something shady is going on with the officers in this case, and that is the officer Maria and then also this politician. Now with the officer Maria, given that there is this history before the Jody case came to be where she had this connection to the pastor and the pastor had this beef with police and the lawsuit. And so there was a part of me that could say that maybe there was something else, another motivation of why she brought this up because they already are having sort of issues and she felt like she was being discriminated against before the Jody thing because of her connection to the pastor. So maybe, you know, it's not like you can fully discount it, but that could explain why she would say that if it wasn't true or legitimate. The part that throws me for a loop is this politician who would usually be on good terms with the officers and felt this odd pushback and wasn't being critical of them, but for some reason they took it that way. And so there's a part of me that says, well, were, were they just like offended that he was putting pressure on them and that's why they had pushback? Or is, as he says, he feels like there's a cover up, right? Cover up is like, what the hell? Why would they cover it up? You know, so those two things um, are odd, right? And then when you look online, and this is just word on the street, like speculation, there's another person, I think his name is Gerald Best, who died, who's, who people speculate an officer did something to him and he was onto something and trying to expose things. And then you also have that weird thing where the officer's wife sent the diary to the news. It's like, what is going on with this, right? And so then I start to think, okay, well, you know, if they were involved, what, what really happened? Did these three people that were named show up in the middle of the night or 4 a.m., 5 a.m. and see Jody and kidnap her and do something to her awful and then try to cover it up? If they were trying to cover it up, I feel like these other leads that seemed really close, wouldn't they be more inclined to sort of pin it on 
some of these people, but it's like they never can. Is it because they can't or because they don't want to? I don't know. I don't know. It's it's very bizarre and I hesitate to speculate too much because, you know, I'm scared. The other theory that is just as um, common and a lot of people think this is what happened is John Van Sice, that neighbor, right? Because he was the last person to see her. He did have this infatuation with her. He would have had sort of the the means and the opportunity to do this. He's much taller than her. He lives in the apartment. But what is the motive? Well, remember the whole mystery man thing that was revealed? What if he found out that she had this relationship with another man and he was upset about it? And it was one of those things of like, if I can't have you, no one can. And it kind of sent him over the edge. And that's why he did something. Then again, he's been given polygraphs and he submitted his DNA and his palm print. And he even underwent hypnosis with the police to like try to get information. And he's apparently never hired an attorney and been very open and, and fully cooperated. And police have not arrested him or anything like that. So I don't know what you feel about the John Van Sice thing. And then there's also like the mystery man, you know, who is this person? Police thought he could have been involved, but nothing came from that either. Um, it's just some guy that, you know, she was dating and this horrible thing happened. Could it be more nefarious? We really don't know much about it other than the fact that they had this hot and heavy relationship uh, right before she went missing. And then you've got the stalker theory, right? And the stalker theory, it could combine a bunch of things. Like what if John was a stalker or there was someone she knew who was a stalker, or it could have been just a total stranger, right? But remember, she felt like someone was calling her or not felt like she said someone was calling her. She thought that this truck was following her. She took self-defense classes. Could it have been a stalker that either saw her from the news or just from around and was waiting for her that day? and took the opportunity when she came out. And then what about the, the other dude, Thomas, the one who had the van and his wife's ex-wife said he was obsessed with Jody. And then he was also like a registered offender sexually. So could he have done something? Why did he freak out about the palm print? You know, were they able to get a print? If he's already in prison, like, can they force him to do it? What are they going to threaten him with? more prison if he's already in there for like a long time. I don't know. See, that's the thing. They, they've been really tight-lipped about this. All the information that I'm able to get is from certain articles and things. And it's not like very detailed to where we can 100% rule someone out. And plus this, this Thomas uh, person with the white van, apparently he died in 2022, I think. So you know, I don't know. It's like she's been missing for 28 years. And the, the way this case came on my radar was actually this, this uh, I think a couple of weeks ago was the 28th anniversary of when she went missing. And her family had this really big push for more information. They want closure. I don't know if they'll ever find out, but I hope so. Um, I would love to know what you guys think happened. And if you've heard anything but in any case, I will leave the information here for any sort of like tips or information that you have. If you do have information, thank you so much for watching. Thank you to Lumi for sponsoring this video and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.